An avatar serves as a captivating condition through which one can explore and experience alternate realities and personas, transcending the physical and the mental boundaries that confine us in our daily lives. It offers an opportunity to delve into realms beyond the self, while still maintaining a connection to one's true essence. As we immerse ourselves in these alternate identities, we begin to question the very nature of our existence and the fluidity of identity itself. The avatar not only represents an extension of who we are, but it also challenges us to confront the malleability of our sense of self. In the process of embodying and becoming the other, we, we found ourselves entwined in the intricate dance between the self and the other, blurring the lines that distinguish one from the other. This intersection of identities presents a paradox. As we navigate the complexities of these newfound personas, we are offered a chance to reflect on our own values, beliefs, and perspectives. By engaging with the avatar, we ultimately confront the concept of a mutable self, shaped by both internal and external factors. Our appearance shapes the reality we constructed our minds, influencing the social roles we assume. Attires such as police uniforms, evening gowns, or school uniforms can impact our behavior and others and responses to us. As we adopt not even forms, do we assume new social roles? What purpose do these roles serve, and what reality do they aim to create? Inspired by the pile of stones, I crafted various avatars to explore alternate realities. In discussing a creation of additional avatars, several compelling questions emerged. What is our connection to the avatar? Do we control it or become it? Can multiple people connect to the same avatar? These questions greatly influenced my research and served as a springboard for subsequent projects. The experiments I conducted took place in virtual reality, a medium that offers a vastly different experience from looking at a screen. The sense of immersion in the pile of stones avatar was putent to VR inequalities. Our border cortex become activated when we enter virtual reality, signaling and generating movement in our bodies. For example, when standing on a virtual cliff for the first time, our instincts may prevent us from jumping off. However, as we adapt to this alternate reality, we learn that jumping off the cliff will not harm us. This phenomenon can be linked to the famous 1896 film Arrival of the Train at La Ciutat, where a train arrives at a station was depicted on the big screen. The audience, overwhelmed by the experience, screamed and retreated to the back of the room. A similar reaction can be observed today in humorous videos of people trying virtual reality for the first time as they scream and get startled by the immersive experience. The immersion of virtual reality fundamentally transforms our perception of avatars, giving the rise to phenomena known as embodiment, a sensation of presence, agency, and control over our bodies. Over time, our brains begin to forge a connection between our avatars and our physical selves. The rubber hand illusion serves as a powerful example of disassociation in which an individual actual hand is concealed and substituted with a rubber head. As the experiment progresses, the person starts to perceive the rubber hand as their own and exhibits a protective response if it is threatened. When applied to VR, the rubber hand becomes a metaphor for the avatar, which has even been shown to cultivate empathy for others, as evidenced by the work conducted at Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. It is crucial to recognize, however, that embodying is not confined into the realm of virtual reality. Video games on a computer screen can also evoke a sense of embodiment, even if the experience is comparatively less immersive. Take for instance the game Stray, where players assume the role of a cat, leading to feline-like behaviors such as knocking objects off tables and navigating through narrow spaces. The cat avatar empowers players to transcend human limitations. Although virtual reality offers a heightened sense of presence in an alternate environment, it does not always facilitate the complete transcendence of our human form. In contrast, traditional video games impose the constraints of our characters we embody with our fingers, enabling us to break free from human limitations and venture into realms of uncharted possibilities. Enriching our understandings of the world and the diverse perspectives it offers. 
in this case enabling us to get a better understanding of cats. Engaging with various characters through the use of controllers or keyboards is an incredible potent yet often overlooked tool. As Soyun Park and I play Stray, we both gained a deeper understanding of cats in general, demonstrating the value and impact of the seemingly simple method of interaction. <laughs> I aimed to explore the concept of crafting a virtual world that felt authentic and palpable. By embracing the avatar in various environments, I hope to learn more about the essence and the connotations we associate with it. In each situation, I found myself pondering questions like what would the avatar do here, and what motivates the avatar in this scenario. Answer these inquiries allowed me to uncover more about the avatar's aspirations, requirements, and desires. Um, Object-oriented ontology seeks to break away from these anthropocentric view by asserting that all objects, regardless of their relationship to human consciousness, have an intrinsic existence of value. This means that object-oriented ontology extends equal importance to animals, bands, rocks, and whatever, and even human-made artifacts, like computers or cars, considering them as individuals entitled with their own unique objecthood. This extends to avatars, which represent more than mere digital reflections of ourselves. They exist as independent entity, possessing agency yet in the real equivalent to our own. When we don an avatar, we immerse ourselves in newly found realities that we create for it. This reality is not solely a manifestation of our desires and intentions, but it is also influenced by the avatar's inherent objecthood. For example, adopting a cat avatar may instill feline traits like agility, curiosity, and independence within us. Consequently, our perception of the world may be altered allowing us to view our surroundings through a mere feline lens. Well, the connotations we ascribe to our avatars are pivotal in shaping this reality. These connotations are dynamic, constantly evolving as we interact with our avatars at a world. By scrutinizing the associations we have with our avatars, we can delve deeper into the reality we construct for them. In doing so, we gain the power to meticulously choose the reality in which we wish to dwell and be preserved in. The power of avatars in a digital realm surpasses individual choices, extending to the potential of moving social reality. In our thesis, we bond in simulation. Soyan Bart contends that our avatar selection mirror our deepest desires, and avatars possesses the ability to navigate the gender and nature of online spaces. For example, Bart opted for a male avatar to evade online sexual harassment and acquire the social privilege associated with a male identity in the virtual world. This emphasizes the ways avatars can be employed to traverse online spaces and the impact they can have on our self-perception and perception of others. Don't misunderstand me. Despite controlling non-human entities, there remains a substantial influence stemming from my human body. I'm not insinuating that the human body is inherently flawed or something to escape. Rather, I am intrigued by the prospect of connecting the human body to something different or transcendent. 
The human body is an incredible designed organism, but why stop there? We can step into various lives and use our bodies to transcend into something greater. Well, these ideas might sound like science fiction, they are fascinating and relevant in today's digital age. Why not delve into the possibilities? Could we alter the notion of having a male body to embody thousands of different forms or even an entire planetary ecosystem? Can we transform our identities into a cloud? Must we confine ourselves to male, female, or familiar identities when defining ourselves? In a virtual space where I am a non-human entity, how would you perceive me if we met in VR? Would I be male, female, or non-binary to you? Do these labels truly matter in this context? The fundamental question is, who or what am I? This ideology is inspired by Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. The central concept of the essay is the cyborg, a hybrid creature that is part human, part machine. Haraway uses the cyborg as a metaphor to challenge rigid boundaries that separates humans from animals, organisms from machines, and the physical form to non-physical. The cyborg represents a blurring of these distinctions. Harway argues that embracing this hybrid can help dismantle rusted structures, including gender binaries and hierarchies. As I pondered over the images and video captured during the experiment, I was struck by the deeply personal interactions between the avatar and me. In a particular image where I stand before the avatar, I see myself duplicated within a singular reality. Although I am observing myself, I perceive the avatar, which was me, as someone else. As the avatar revealing who I am from another person's perspective, as the avatar stands next to me, I gaze at it, at myself, but I fail to recognize my own reflection. It's only when I concentrate on the avatar's movements that I can truly see myself. It is unlike looking into a mirror, where I tend to fixate on my own appearance, since that's all I can see. In this scenario, I observe myself through a warped lens, as though I was witnessing someone else through a unique filter. By examining myself, I shed the preconceived notions I had associated with my identity. The idea of embodying avatars can be extended beyond our conscious efforts to create them. In our everyday lives, we are constantly surrounded by sound, which can become a part of the collective avatar we embody. For instance, in a typical office environment, the sound of people typing on a keyboard, grabbing a cup of coffee, and chatting with one another, all come together to create one unique soundscape. As we immerse ourselves in this environment, become one with it, sharing the feeling of being a part of it, and contributing to its creation. Similarly, when we found ourselves stuck in traffic, sound of honking warns, engine raving, and radios playing can all contribute to the collective avatar of frustration and impatience. We become a part of the avatar as we sit in our cars, feeling the frustration and anxiety that comes with being stuck in traffic. Richard Rothfuss emphasizes the importance of narrative and self-creation in identity formation. Individuals craft their identities through the stories they tell themselves and others about who they are and what they value. This process and self-narration offers a degree of freedom and self-determination. As we can choose to emphasize or de-emphasize certain aspects of our lives when constructing our identity. Connecting Rothy's theories of irony in the idea of cognitive system running all these different identities offers further insights into our understanding of self.
Ravi argues that individuals should adopt an ironic stance towards their own beliefs and identities, recognizing that these are contents and subjects to change. By embracing irony, individuals can maintain a sense of humility and openness, acknowledging that their identity are not fixed or objectively grounded, but are rather subject to revision in light of new experiences and insights. As I consider the multitude of identities that I create for the avatars, I come to realize that they are all integral components of my cognitive system. Each identity is a unique manifestation born from the influence of my existence and environment. These creations do not only embody the essence of myself, but also hold the power to influence the other identities that I inhabit and will create in the future. This mindset promises to question whether the world in which we live actually reflects the multifaceted interconnectedness that defines our existence. Society frequently pushes us into narrowly defined categories, pressuring us to develop our own style or be ourselves. Yet, yeah, what does it truly really mean to be oneself? Or to have a unique style? Are these notions genuine or are they merely constructs that mask the duper connection between us all? Love it. As you saw the reef, I'm influenced by both the physical and digital world. The digital realm in particular has a significant impact on my identity as Drunk Rainbow. However, when I assume this persona, I do not speak or behave as I would as Shus van der Beer. Are these alter egos or distinct facets of a singular identity? Regardless, these various personas coexist and influence one another, shaping my overall sense of self, the cognitive system running all my identities. My identity also takes on different roles and meanings in the lives of others. I have a child to my mother, a friend to my peers, and an unknown person to strangers. These diverse relationships contribute to my multifaceted identity, illustrating the complex nature of human existence. <laughs> In my own upbringing, my mother was the head of the household, and my father was unfamiliar with tasks like laundry or irony. This highlights how we as humans attempt to make sense of reality by posing restrictions and categories on individuals, trying to fit our multifaceted identities into singular, simplistic boxes. The participants in my project projected a shallow, one-dimensional version of the identity they attributed to each avatar. If I were to choose a label, gender fluid seem most fitting. Gender fluid individuals experience their gender identity as dynamic changing over time or between situations, and not confined to any singular gender identity. I hesitate to call myself non-binary because I find it difficult to develop an identity that is not connected to the gender norms imposed on me during childhood. Although my upbringing was quite gender neutral, I played with both Barbie and wore princess dresses, as well as toy cars and video games not typically considered for girls. The presence of gender was always evident. A society perceived certain activities and toys as either for boys or for girls. I embodied the essence of the respective gender while engaging with these various toys. 
Through conducting this research to gain a deeper understanding of myself, I've learned more than I anticipated. I come to realize that I'm not a singular entity, but rather a cognitive system with multiple identities. And my identity transcends a singular gender. I embody various personas through my existence and daily life. If I must apply a label, I now identify as gender fluid, a realization that emerged from this very paper. As I mentioned earlier, I may never fully understand myself, and I may never know where I truly am, but I'm at peace with that. In fact, I'm even excited by the prospect that this process has no definitive endpoint, and my exploration of self will continue to surprise me until my time comes to an end. Or will it? Perhaps I'll be reincarnated as a digital clone, and my digital counterpart can carry on the pursuit of understanding my special our identity.